Hey, everybody. So we're here to talk to GE Appliances CEO. Uh, GE, you're huge. You make lots of stuff. Um, you're a coat and tie guy. Um, I am interested in what you're doing about the future of work. What's the coolest thing GE Appliances is doing right now? Well, I would say there's a lot going on at GE Appliances. We've got give us the coolest thing out the of the coolest lot. thing is probably a first build where we're doing some real interesting things on the edge of how do you bring innovation, how do you bring uh, a new way of work into a uh, kind of an old corporate so tell, culture. So give us a snapshot of First Build. So First Build is located on University of Louisville campus. It's a partnership that uh, has come up, but it's a micro factory. So what First Build is, it is a complete business, but it contains a factory. So we do everything there from designing products, selling product, but most important manufacturing. So, so I want to give, give so so on in, in your real in, in the real company in, in GE appliances, you're making stoves and refrigerators and I mean I assume you're making all of the stuff we know you know of GE you know bringing. Ho hopefully we all like, know yeah, about you're, you're, you're making appliances. all that stuff. But then you have this side thing first first built. So I want to explain to people and it's all under GE appliances. That's right. That's right. So the side thing is we we also make appliances. But it's an interesting, it's a completely open space. We also have local artists making artwork. We have local entrepreneurs creating all kinds of different things. But we make some pretty cool stuff, like we have a new ice maker, Opal Ice. But what's interesting there is everything we create is kind of created with a community. It's created not with just our employees, it's cr created with people all over the world. So how many of you know what that soft melting nugget ice is that you like to suck on? <laughs> You, you, you know, raise your hands if you know what I'm talking about. You know what nugget Good ice is. Raise them ice. big, be bold. I mean, wouldn't you like to have one of those in your own home, right? Yeah, so, so you had an employee. I mean, do you wear a suit and tie at, at, at first build? I actually don't wear this. This I had to pull the tag off. We actually don't Take wear the these. Take the tie so, off. So I can, like, I mean, I'll, I, I'll loosen you it, know, right? I, I'll I, loosen the tie. I, I think GE is cooler here. This is what I'm going to get at. Is that you? Yeah, take it off, take it off. Okay, we'll, we'll, do, yeah. it. we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. Uh, so it actually feels much better now. There you go. Yeah, I know. So we're going to get to the real story here. So, so you had an employee who says, God, I love to suck on this, this, this nugget ice, and we ought to have one for the home, right? And they, they, they built that, that's, and that's been a big seller. That's right. Opal. That's right. You know, first build, it's one of the, what we do is we try to go from idea to production in months. We started selling Opal before we ever actually engineered it. Mm -hmm. So we just went out there and started selling it, and all of a sudden we got a lot of orders, so we figured then we'd have to design and so make it. So this was an innovation from a worker, an employee, or a student, someone inside your world said, hey, let's do this, let's make it. Yeah, I would say it's not even just that. It was an idea, but then it was a community effort to put this thing together and to figure out what how to do it. What are some of the other ideas you've had? A real cool one is pizza. How many people like pizza? So we have a indoor pizza oven. Most, if you want to cook real high-end pizza, you have to build an outdoor with flames, and you know it needs to get to 14, 1500 degrees. We figured out a way we can do that in your house. Sounds kind of crazy, so it it doesn't have a door. It goes up to 1500 degrees. Uh, it is safe, uh, but that was all designed and thought of uh, through first build. And what about the Spanish-speaking washer dryer? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, so. It speaks many languages now, which is amazing. Yeah. It was actually, there was a 14-year-old student that needed a science fair project that had, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, we have, uh, we do most of the Braille, so for the blind, there's a big community there. And he would, had done some projects, so he thought, for the blind, how do we make washers more accessible? So this kid came in, he was an amazing programmer, made this device that converts one of our appliances and allows it to talk. And we've actually gone into production. Um, and, but it was an amazing place where a 14-year-old student put a, so his science fair was pretty cool, right? It's a kid that's actually selling a, a device and having a real need. But I'd say that's some of the beauty of First Build, too, allows things like that to happen. Hasta la vista, you know, yeah. like get, get it going. Yeah. So, so um, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is you're the president CEO of GE Appliances, and with all due respect, GE Appliances does not, has, does not for me, rep, it, it sort of represents the metaphor if you were to kind of build a million dryers, you're not going to be the place that somebody can come up and say, hey, you know, let's figure out how I can develop the perfect uh, nugget ice home manufacturer. And I'm interested in how, whether that was a challenge for you 
culturally from become you know from from being this giant uh, uh, juggernaut mm -hmm. of manufacturing to trying to be sensitive to some somebody's interesting idea. Well, I'd say you know we do make millions of things, right? You know, and we are big on U.S. manufacturing. We've reshored a lot of man manufacturing into the U.S. But we really saw the future of that for that to be sustainable, right. you have to have innovation. I think you're going to see more customization coming, and also there's more technology that's coming in that's coming in very quickly. So with all that, it really, that's what created First Build. I think First Build was an experiment to see what can we do different. But it really is about how do we continue to bring innovation in the millions, right? And how do we bring good, productive jobs back into our manufacturing facilities? So I would say First Build is an experiment of a culture, but the whole thing we're doing now is we're bringing that culture back into what you might think of as an old 100-year-old company. We like to say we're a right. one-year-old startup. We're not a 100-year-old company. You know, the Atlantic Magazine is 160-year-old this week, so I'm very, I like hanging out with <laughs> other, other semi-elders uh, uh, that are still around. And, and, but I, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in this question, James Fallows, for those of you who get the Atlantic and you keep it at home and your shelves, which I hope you do, you go back to this cover story called Comeback, and GE Appliances was a very big part of that story about manufacturing coming back to the United States, and you were kind of the forefront of Jim's, uh, of Jim's uh, profile. Yeah, so that, that was, I think it was around 2008, something right. around there, 2007. We were in the process. We put $800 million in Louisville, Kentucky in manufacturing. We brought a lot of manufacturing back from overseas. And that article was very timely because I think we were progressive. We ran into a lot of troubles post that article, I'd say. And some as me, I didn't, I've, I've worked overseas a lot. I've worked in manufacturing facilities all over the world. And I didn't understand the skill gap and the issues that we were going to walk into when we reinvested and we reshored. And post that, we really got into issues. Did we have the right skills? You know, I was using an analogy before. If you took a, a mechanic that was working on a car from the 70s and 80s, right. if you brought them a car that's built today, they'll look at it, right? And I don't think, you know, where's the carburetor? And we kind of had that feeling because we had been outsourcing for years. And you look at our skilled trades and this equipment that we bought was kind of like looking at a new car of what do I do? How do I fix it? How do I work with it? So we ran into a lot of issues. You brought, you told me about 3,000 new jobs into that. How, and you, but you said that the, the, the profile, the footprint of how many people you actually had to hire to get to 3,000 was how many? We, so we brought about 5,000 in to, because of attrition. There are all kinds of skill issues. Um, you know, another statistics, over the next five years, 40% of our skilled trades will retire. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this nation, we have a whole air, air generation that's going to retire and what have we done to bring those skills back into the workforce? And the skills that they were trained on are much different. Right? So what are you doing? So we're doing a lot. I would say, you know, it's one we're leading, not just us, but the industry around Louisville, Kentucky. There's about 23 companies. We've created what we call FAME, which is a, a, an advanced manufacturing training. Uh, but it's very much industry-led, but government partnerships and university partnership. I think that's the secret. Is I do firmly believe industry needs the lead because we know what our problems are. We know what the skill set, we know the way work is going, and it's changing fast. I mean, every year you're seeing the, the pace of change. But then it's got to be supported through public policy, and it's got to be supported through universities. How digitally adept uh, are your, your people coming into the door as opposed to five years ago? You know, I think it's the students coming out, they're much more digitally adept. Um, but it's one where it's funny, you see kind of cross-training. They know things, but then at the, at the same, just because you know how to use your smartphone doesn't know that, you know, you can run a, a $3 million piece of equipment on a factory floor that might have similar technology, but much different. How many of you have been in a factory? Just interested? Wow. Well, if I were good. in uh, New York or D.C., there would be like two hands that went up. So this is a factory-aware audience. I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, I have been, we were just talking, this been in a factory, but, but there used to be in communities around this country a stigma associated with manufacturing that, that particularly grandparents, parents had uh, worries about manufacturing being the false promise for their children and in a way kind of discouraging some children there. Do you deal with that at all? Do you see that? You know, I, I've talked to the governors of, of Ohio, of Pennsylvania, 
of Massachusetts and said that you know manufacturing is new and different, but there still is a resistance out there and people yeah, going yeah. into these jobs. So I'd say more than just seeing it, I've dealt with it myself personally. I grew up in Connecticut. You know, Connecticut, I was Stanford, Connecticut, was a manufacturing, my father's generation, everything seemed to be made between Bridgeport, Stanford. It all moved out. I went mm -hmm. to university, University of Connecticut, wanted to get into manufacturing. I moved into GE at the time. That factory closed, you know, after I moved in. So I just saw, I had a view that manufacturing was gone from the, uh, from the U.S. And I think a lot of that is students have been told those jobs are going to go away. And as I've gone through my career, if you were to talk to me 20 years ago, I would be sitting here saying we need to be prepared, those jobs are going away. As I sit here today, I have 100% confidence those will be the jobs of the future. Those jobs are coming back to America in a strong, in a, and they will come back year after year after Your year in a strong way. Your facilities are expanding and growing? They're expanding. The economics work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, especially with the new, new technology, you're going to want to manufacture locally. There's going to be, and I go back to Connecticut all the time and tell people there is a, they don't believe there's manufacturing job. I say, come on out, I'll hire you. I have job openings. I mean, we have a skill gap. So the issue isn't the jobs coming. They're going to come, I'm completely convinced, and they'll be here for a long time. And I think that's what people didn't trust. Should I start a career that maybe in five years might vanish? And I really think that's not going to be the case. One of the other astonishing things I just learned about your company I was unaware of is that while we know GE Appliances, your mothership is a higher corporation from Shandong province in China. That's right. That's right. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I've written about... Uh, uh, the Chinese economy and Chinese investment around the world. And most Chinese investment in the world is, is bottom fishing, looking for assets that don't require uh, significant new levels of investment. And usually it's kind of to drive their ability to kind of continue to produce uh, uh, washers and dryers in China that they export to the world. I haven't seen much investment like yours where they've come in and actually expanded in, there, in an area like manufacturing. Can you give us a quick snapshot sure, of what that's sure. like? And how's your Mandarin? My Mandarin's a little weak. So we've been for 13 months, about 14 months now, uh, we were acquired by High Air. High Air is a big global company. Um, we're now the largest uh, appliance company in the world when you put G Appliances and uh, High Air together. Mm. Uh, the f I've been in my role as CEO for three to four months. Um, I guess it's four months now. Before that, I was CTO um, of appliances, but then became CTO of the global company. Mm. So at first, it was interesting where Hire made the acquisition. Typically, you see they'll put people here. It actually was the opposite. I had, you know, I basically started working in Qingdao, China, um, trying to drive globally, you know, how we could work from a technical standpoint. And they're very interesting. They're a very progressive company. And I'd say I hope this is what the future holds because. They are very bullish on manufacturing in the U.S. also. So a lot of people come in and say, hey, they're going to you know, be at us to reshore. And it's, it's the opposite. They're actually working, how do we help train? How do we help develop our technical, our manufacturing skills to manufacture here? So I think that's another um, you know, bias that maybe we have that uh, I think is not reality, because it makes sense. When you look at things like appliances, you don't want to be shipping these things across the water. And it just, the economics work, you need to serve. And I think you're going to find that more and more with manufacturing. Manufacturing is going to want to go back to being very local. And it used to be that way. You know, Henry Ford and some made so that everyone thought scale mattered. But people want customized. They want mm -hmm. products that are good for them. And I think Hyair is very uh, forward thinking and seeing that trend and being very supportive of where we need do, to go. Do they support you in things like first build and understanding that part of having that creative edge is, uh, uh, because I, I honestly, knowing a lot of Chinese firms, I can't think of any of them that have a first build-like operation. Yeah, what, what was fascinating to me when the chairman came in, and I'll tell you the truth, I can bring a lot of people from GE in the first build and no one got it. Huh. And when I, the chairman came in, he got it right away. So it actually gave me a very warm feeling about uh, what kind of company they were. Uh, but it is, I think, a diff they're, they're kind of on the leading edge of, I would say, companies in China right now, but they definitely got it. So before I go to the um, audience, where can I get an Opal and a Smart Wine Chiller and the Precision Cooktop? <laughs> So the Opal's easy. Go on. I think it's, you can, I think, look, opal.com, or we're now selling actually yeah. on Amazon. Do you have, uh, like, friends and family discounts? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Typically, probably not. editorially not allowed. <laughs> uh, but but no, it's it's interesting. I mean, it, it 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 is interesting to to think about. I mean, I think any large organization has this challenge of how do you stay crisp, nimble, and also retain people, right? How do you keep people wanting to be in the space you're at? And, and you're also training a lot of folks. How do you not have them uh, you know, free ride on your uh, en you know, training vouchers and then go work for the enemy? You know, I think th one thing I've said, you have an open door whether you like it or not. Hmm. So people can try to protect and keep, the, you know, I've invested in a key. The only way you keep people nowadays is provide interesting, exciting work. And I think that's what we're trying to prove. First build, we have people just coming in. We, we hired one employee that we found. You know, I, I went in there. We're open from 9 in the morning till 9 at night. Um, we're open six days a week, so it's a different kind of place. And I came in one Saturday wanting to actually use some equipment. I found an employee sleeping there, right? And we were worried this kid's homeless or something. Well, he just loved the place so much, we hired him on. I mean, we couldn't get rid of him. So I said, why don't we actually hire him? The kid's... So I think you have to have places that are exciting, uh, uh, and you got to be in tune with what people want. What kind of careers, what are they looking for? I want to work. Uh, Margaret, I want to sleep in my office. I love it so much. <laughs> uh, uh, let me take a question or two real quickly. Yes, hi. Uh, let's get you a microphone real quick. This is Ben. He's going to run it over real fast. We're going to do two quick, two quick comments real quick and then a response. Hi, uh, real who quick, are you? Ellen Dunham-Jones from Georgia Tech. Good to see and you, Ellen. My question is, that you mentioned the, the manufacturing wants to be more localized, we're seeing more customization. With 3D printers and right. uh, you know, the, the size, do you see manufacturing also becoming much more decentralized? And instead of one you, big plant in one city, it's a thousand Beautiful, but before you answer that, let me um, go right hard to this lady as well. 3D printing and, and really taking on the, 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 lar the, the, the big can be small and the small can be big. Yeah. Hello, my name is Tanya Hicks and my company is Women Do Everything. I am a master electrician and I also have an electrical contracting company. I've been in business 17 years, but I'm an industrial electrician by trade. Uh -huh. And so I, was, I came here because he was going to be here because <laughs> I love GE. <laughs> Thank you. And, <laughs> and um, what I wanted to know, because with Women Do Everything, we're introducing women and helping them get trained in male-dominated industries like construction and manufacturing. Right is when it comes to your um, appliances, you said so a little bit about training, because we want to train women to work on the latest technologies, to not just work on the motors, but also work on the digital parts of your new um, appliances. S super, thank you. So two quick questions. Yeah, to get one. this one on uh, uh, 3D printing and what that's doing as a dynamic in this. And the other is really how do you create ongoing, continue next generation uh, training and particularly with, 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 with women? I, I think it's a great question. Yeah, so the first localized, I do believe it. If you look at first build, we really learned a lot from a company called Local Motors. Um, this Jay Rogers, if you look, has the philosophy that you will localize. They can print and a car in like it, exactly. an island. So I do see it. Now, yeah. Jay thinks it's coming really quick. I, I don't know how quick. Uh, but I think you're going to start seeing maybe mass platforms with customizing platforms locally. And I think certain industries are going to want to localize more. Lighting, you know, different cities. So I do think that's the future. I think we'll look back 30 years from now and see some of these big, massive factories in question. Was that really the right thing? Hmm. Now, as far as you know, women in the workforce, um, from a technical standpoint, it's a real issue. Um, we do a lot of work with the universities. We do a lot of work with uh, our uh, local high schools, elementary schools. Is people need to understand that what these jobs are like, right? And that these jobs are interesting. We need to get because. You have students, my daughter was a perfect example, love science, love math, but she's now kind of wanted to get into your type of field, right? But I'm like, no, you should be an you engineer. You say that so right? disdainfully. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a big education we have to do. Um, and I think, you know, with new technology, with software, I'm seeing some progress, but there is still a gap. You know, University of Louisville, we only have about 10%, 12% of the students going through the engineering school are, are female. 
and we have to do something as a country because there's so many bright minds that aren't being applied where they can add a lot of value. Do you find ways to work with organizations like hers that are actually working with networks of women to try to kind of continue to build? Do you, do you, do you have outreach um, arms? We do. We do a lot with STEM. So we do a lot locally um, with students. We do a lot with First Build, trying to bring people in and, and get a lot of exposure. Because I think a lot is early exposure. The problem, a lot of people want to work with universities. That's too late. You've got to work with elementary schools and show that you know, this is interesting and you have an ability, right? that you can be really successful at it. Cool. And so it's a long-term investment, but that's where you have to make it, I, I believe. Well, thank you for taking off your tie. Thank you for Opal and the uh, pizza thing. Thank you for sharing us a little bit about how you're running your company today. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Nolan, President and CEO of Chief. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks very much.